All right. Well, hello. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for this exciting first session of the IACH for Nurses. Um, I'm Nancy Long. I'm the APP lead here at Vanderbilt Ingram Cancer Center for our Transplant and Cellular Therapy Department. And then I'm joined by our moderator, Dr. Deloria, who's a physician colleague, as well as one of my CAR-T mentors. So I'm excited to be a part of this program today. Glad to be part of this conference today. Thank you, Nancy. All right, so we'll jump into CAR-T, acute and long-term complications. I'm hoping that this presentation will guide us as nurses and advanced practice providers when we're managing these patients. So I have no disclosures. Our objectives today, really just going over CAR-T basics, patient logistics, talking about who's eligible, but the bulk of this presentation will recommend or outline the recommendations to aid us as APPs and nurses in identifying and managing acute and long-term complications with our patients receiving CAR-T. So to get to the basics, what is CAR-T? Um, I really like this image from our colleagues at Dana-Farber. So CAR-T essentially is using gene therapy to perform immunotherapy. Um, the CAR-T cell therapy uses our patient's own T cells. They're then genetically modified in a laboratory to make a protein called a chimeric antigen receptor, CAR. Um, these receptors are proteins that have been engineered to give those T cells the new ability to target a specific protein. When these T cells are returned to our patients, those cells will seek out and destroy the cancer cells wherever they're found in the body. So it sounds really cool. And when we're educating our patients, oftentimes they're super excited, but, but kind of weary because it's a different sort of therapy for them as well. So it's important for us as nurses and APPs to help guide them through what to expect acutely and in the long-term setting. So considerations for our patients who we think could undergo CAR. Um, we're looking at commercial products. There's, of course, clinical trials ongoing, but typically our patients with relapse, refractory, large B-cell lymphoma, follicular, mantle cell, or B-ALL, and then we have pediatric B-ALL as well. Our myeloma patients now have entered the commercial uh, market as well if they've progressed after multiple lines of therapy. One of the things we really look at, though, is the clinical stability of our patients. So one of the first considerations you want to have as your patient's provider or nurse is, can this patient weight T-cell collection and then manufacturing prior to infusion. You're also going to do a really thorough assessment of your patient to guide your um, judgment based on their comorbidity. So organ function testing, echocardiogram, pulmonary function test. And then you consider your actual versus physiolog physiological age for your patient. I have highlighted here one of our oldest patients here at Vanderbilt that's received CAR. Um, she was published in our reporter. She was 86 at the time of receiving CAR-T, and now she's 88 and still in remission. So this is an awesome therapy that's not limited by our patient's age. And I like to say age is just a number. So advocate for your patients appropriately once you've determined their stability and their comorbidities. Now, just briefly to touch on patient requirements. So we know per RIMS requirement, which is risk evaluation and mitigation strategy, um, our patients receiving CAR, they're gonna have to be close to the center in which they're gonna receive the therapy. It's also a tough conversation sometimes to tell your patient they're not gonna be able to drive or operate heavy machinery for eight weeks. Um, requirement for a 24 hour caregiver is our baseline when a patient is out of the hospital. We follow an outpatient model that I'll go into a little bit. And then abstaining from alcohol, tobacco, or illicit drug use is also really important for our patients. Now, I like this slide just to get in a little bit more of the nitty gritty of what our patients experience. Um, so our patients are collected via peripheral blood. Typically, our patients are getting a central line. We get those T cells. They're sent off to the manufacturer who then will make those CAR T cells in the lab. The CAR T cells, they grow millions of CAR T cells. They get delivered to your facility, and then we infuse those CAR T cells. Typically, patients are receiving some lymphodepletion chemotherapy prior to that infusion, and then those CAR T cells go and attack the cancer cells. So at that point, that's really when these toxicities we're gonna to discuss will occur. So I thought for us as nurses and APPs, it's important to follow a patient during this. So I wanted to kind of do a case study intertwined with this talk. Um, so I wanna talk about a patient, 54 year old male, past medical history of fatty liver, and he has relapsed mantle cell lymphoma. Um, he was in his normal state of health, and then he noticed a lump in his left groin, um, it was progressive in nature, but he thought it was a hernia. Um, he then noticed left submandibular adenopathy that he thought he just had poor dental hygiene. He had an ENT eval, and that CT revealed multiple areas of adenopathy. He then had a biopsy that was consistent with mantle cell lymphoma. 
bone marrow biopsy was also positive. And because he had disease below, below and above the diaphragm, he was considered stage four. You can see over here, his treatment history was extensive. This patient had an auto transplant and then multiple lines of therapy prior to being presented for CAR T. You can see social history, he was active, a plumber, no smoking, alcohol, or illicit drug use. So this is our patient that we're gonna follow through the acute and long-term toxicities. This is pretreatment imaging for our patient. So you can see he has lots of bulky disease here um, all throughout his body. Um, this was interval progression of lymphoma. And again, this is right before we were using CAR-T. So lots of disease for CAR-T to attack. So what happens in this acute period? So we know that accurate assessment and prompt management of toxicities can mitigate the adverse outcomes associated with this potential curative immunotherapy. We need to monitor our patient frequently at design time points to implement our interventions that we're going to discuss swiftly and efficiently. So here at Vanderbilt, we can utilize an outpatient model of CAR-T monitoring system for our commercial products. Some facilities don't have this readily available, and so they are admitted, typically for a week, to see if they can have uh, or the resolution of toxicities. At our center, patients are seen daily in person um, in our outpatient transplant and cellular therapy unit. And then we have telehealth visits as well. Three touch points occur. So again, they're monitored very closely. And for us, we actually use remote monitoring as well. So we have morning visits, an afternoon, and an evening visit for our patient that's undergoing CAR-T. So they also are given a CAR-T phone, which is carried by an APP. So this empowers us as APP the nurses to know what we should look for for our patients. Um, our initial data from our experience administering our commercial products in the outpatient setting was published by one of our own, Dr. Delory on the call, um, that it is safe and effective to manage these patients out, manage patients outpatient as long as you have the proper tools. Um, let's see, we also use daily labs. TLS prophylaxis is important for our patients. So we're talking about allopurinol. Seizure prophylaxis is key, and we'll talk about why. And then, of course, like many of our patients receiving treatment, we're also using antimicrobial prophylaxis. CRS and ICANN's grading, which we're going to go into, should be documented by us, the APPs and nurses, at least twice per day, or if there's any changes in your patient status. Now, the first toxicity I want to talk about is cytokine release syndrome. So early clinical trials of CD19 CAR T cells quickly uncovered greater toxicities than those seen in other cellular therapies, basically indicating that our patients were having profound and generalized immune system activation. In the first pediatric ALL patients treated, it was clear that this super physiological cytokine elevation was responsible for the vast majority of these um, symptoms, suggesting that the toxicities were a result of CRS. CRS is not specific, um, particularly to these CD19 CAR T cells, but you can also see them for BCMA, CD22, and other immune effector cell therapies such as lenitubumab. The ASTCT has defined CAR-T as this super physiological response following any immunotherapy that results in the activation or engagement of these infused T cells. So what does it look like for your patients? Because this is what we're going to be teaching them. Usually we tell them when we're educating our patients prior to CAR, it's a flu-like syndrome. So fevers, constitutional symptoms, we monitor their blood pressure closely. If you can remember, we have our patients on remote monitors here at our center tachycardia, hypoxia. We're monitoring inflammatory markers like CRP, LDH. And the onset for CRS, it's important to know what product your patient has received and what their disease burden is. Because we know a risk factor could be high disease burden, um, thrombocytopenia, high peak of expansion for these CAR T cells, and our comorbidities. So that's why it's really important to get that good assessment up front for your patient. It typically can resolve in a couple of days, but it could last up to two weeks for our patients. So how do we grade this? So initially, there were numerous grading systems um, to determine the severity of CRS. The problem was this resulted not only in differences in reported CRS incidences of clinical trials, but it also hampered the comparability of safety profiles for those different CAR-T products. So recognizing this disparity in published grading schemes and the need to harmonize all of these definitions and grading systems for CRS, um, experts got together in 2018, um, supported by the American Society for Transplant and Cellular Therapy, also known as AFTCT. Um, and those leaders were from academic institutions, um, industry, and other sources. 
So basically a consensus was published in 2019 and is now our gold standard for this consensus grading. So you can see here, in order even to get to grade one, our fever is gonna be present. So typically a temperature greater than or equal to 38 degrees Celsius, that's temporarily associated with CAR T cell administration. So within 24 hours to three weeks of receiving product, that could be a CRS diagnosis. Hypotension and hypoxia, you can also see our principal determinants of CRS grade and severity. So I won't break this down too much because I know y'all are all smart, but this is what we use for grading here. So how do we manage? And again, I know this is a busy slide, but I just wanted you to know the resources. So we start over here at grade one. If you remember, that's a fever. So we're gonna do supportive treatment, IV fluid for hydration, uh, give them antipyretics, and then symptomatic management of any constitutional symptoms. But you're also gonna monitor if someone's coming in with a fever, do your typical infectious workup at that time too. And then consider for some patients, maybe that are at high risk for complications, or elderly or frail patients, do we need to escalate to start to do more interventions like tocilizumab? Grade two, continue that supportive care, and that's when you're really going to use the tocilizumab here. When we have a patient starting, um, we want to make sure that tocilizumab is readily available for our patients. So that's you helping coordinate with pharmacy to make sure that's available for every patient that goes through CAR T. Now grade three, you can see that supportive care, but then likely your patient's gonna be sent to an ICU, mainly for vasopressor support. So they're hypotensive at this point. You're gonna to continue to tocilizumab per grade two, and then likely start to incorporate some steroids too. If you're improving, we like to taper those steroids really quickly, um, especially if they're moving towards grade one. If they're not improving, then we're gonna to escalate to grade four management. This grade four, you wanna make sure that your patient's having an airway protected. Maybe this requires intubation. You could consider dialysis if you're starting to see an organ damage. You're gonna increase your steroids and you're gonna continue the tocilizumab. If they're not improving, maybe this is when we start to talk about alternate immunosuppression, drugs like anakinra or mepotrexate at this point. So just briefly, um, tocilizumab, which I mentioned quite often in our grading scale, it's a humanized monoclonal antibody that selects uh, so selectively targets IL-6 receptor, so that prevents IL-6 from binding to other targets and increasing inflammation. So it's an IV infusion for us that give it at the bedside. It's generally really well tolerated, minimal side effect protocol, or uh, min minimal side effect profile. We do require pre-medication with Tylenol and Benadryl. If a patient responds, usually they respond pretty quickly. Um, and you'll start to see that hypotension, hypoxia resolve within a few days. It is a very expensive drug. Um, and recently there was limited supply at some facilities. So again, it's important to make sure before you start a patient that this is available. Now the early use of tocilizumab has been found to reduce the rate of severe CRS and in organ dysfunction without affecting expansion, persistence, and response rate of those CAR T cells. Um, studies have looked at it using prophylactically. Again, though, if you remember, it's super expensive. Um, so right now it's not currently used at our center in a, a prophylactic manner. Steroids, I know most of us have given steroids, we've written for steroids or we've handed it to our patients. Um, they exert a nonspecific anti-inflammatory effect by inducing generalized lymphocyte apoptosis and blocks further T-cell activation. We know steroids are hard on our patients. They have long-term negative side effects with steroids. It's recommended when you're treating for CRS to give a brief treatment course followed by a rapid taper as your CRS symptoms resolve. Um, so one cohort study of Zuma-1, it was cohort six, actually looked at the effect of prophylactic steroids um, for our patients going through CAR-T, and we saw that they had delayed CRS and had no instance of grade three or higher CRS. So that was awesome because it wasn't impacting our CAR T cell efficacy. So we can give these steroids prophylactically, small doses, inexpensive, and then we can prevent some of these severe side effects that we mentioned without impacting the outcome of the patient from the CAR T therapy. So let's get back to our patient. Um, so he's day plus six, he comes in with a neutropenic fever, um, we directly admit him to the hospital because you can see that T max is 38.9 uh, Celsius. Vital signs are okay. He is tachycardic at this point, and we notice that he has chills and headache, but otherwise his exam is unremarkable. You can tell he's neutropenic. So he's grade one at this point, and we treated him with supportive care, and he did well with that for that day. However, 
On day seven, he remained febrile. He's still tachycardic and his blood pressure dropped for us. We did find that he had rhinovirus at the time. Chest x-ray was normal and you can see the subsequent labs. So just a reminder on this left-hand side, you still wanna do your full infectious workup for this patient, just like we did to confirm if there's any infectious source, like possibly rhinovirus. He was started on broad spectrum IV antibiotics in supportive care. But at this point, he's fevered for over 24 hours. So we're gonna escalate him to grade two CRS. And he was given one dose of tocilizumab, normal saline and fever curve initially started to downtrend for us. So we've dealt with CRS, what can happen after that? So we talk about immune effector cell associated neurotoxicity, also called ICANs. So the ASTCT says this is a disorder characterized by a pathological process involving the central nervous system following any immune therapy that results in the activation um, of those infused T cells or other immune effector cells. In contrast to CRS, ICANN's patho pathophys is not as well understood. Um, we think maybe CNS trafficking of CAR T cells, passive diffusions of cytokines into the CNS. Um, we've also seen ICANN's in other uh, CAR T cells beyond CD19, so CD22, BCMA, um, like CRS, similar neurotoxic symptoms have been reported with other immune effector cell um, therapies, such as blenitubumab. And you can see this in a little over half of the patients. Um, so that's kind of where we're going to go next. So what does it look like? This can be especially scary when you're educating your patients as the advanced practice provider or nurse. Typically, it happens a little bit later than CRS. Um, but you can have delayed CRS occurring three to four weeks after CAR-T. So that's important to know, too. ICANS typically presents with the impairment of attention, confusion, expressive aphasia, changes in handwriting. They're considered fairly specific in early signs of ICANS. It can, uh, can progress into a depressed level of consciousness, coma, seizures. Um, we will say, um, and cerebral edema. All cases of fatal cerebral edema were associated with CRS and severe CRS has been shown to be associated with severe ICANS. If you do an LP, likely you're going to see that there's elevated protein, indicating that there's a blood-brain barrier disruption at that time. Um, risk factors similar to CRS, um, but pre-existing neurological conditions, as well as having an elevated LDH. This is typically reversible um, and can resolve in a few days, but it can take longer than CRS and continue for a few weeks. So this is really important for us as nursing and advanced practice providers. So like CRS, ICANS has gone through a number of iterations and grading scales. So when the ASTCT group came together to create CRS guidelines, they also developed a similar consensus for neurotox and determined, uh, developed the term ICANS. The ICANS grading profile incorporates a 10-point scale called the Immune Effector Cell Encephalopathy Score, otherwise known as ICE. Um, and that is going to assess the patient's level of consciousness, occurrence of seizures, motor findings, and signs of elevated ICP. For us at the bedside, we need to be doing this twice daily with ICANS grading. And if this drops below 10, then we should be doing it every four hours. So you can see here we're asking our questions to our patients, basic neuro exam questions, having them count backwards um, from 100 by 10, and we even have them write a sentence. And this occurs every day during that process. So grading, I know this is a busy slide, but I just kind of wanted to go over how we're grading this too. You can see one point off from your ICE score, you're going to be at grade one ICANS. So they may have a delayed response, disorientation, mild inattention, and with difficulty in counting numbers backwards, or their sentence may look different to you at the bedside. There may be drowsiness, but that patient's going to awake spontaneously. And when prompted, the patient could complete most of the assessment. Um, you can see this, you know, when our patients have high fevers during CRS, when they're waxing and waning during those episodes. Grade two, we're often going to see expressive aphasia, limiting the ability to communicate spontaneously. They may have paraphasic errors um, and verbal preservation. So think about saying the same words over and over. They may not be able to write their sentence due to poor handwriting. They can't name an object for you. Um, they are able to communicate their needs, but it takes effort. So then we escalate up to grade three. These patients are gonna have severe global aphasia. They're not gonna speak or follow commands for you when you're doing your assessment, even when they're wide awake. And they may be unable to answer any of those ICE questions. They also may have excessive drowsiness and need tactile stimulus to attend to us as examiners. And then any seizure at this point would be considered a grade three. 
Now, if they progress to grade zero, uh, have an I score of zero, then grade four would be what we would call them. They're unarousable. They can't perform their ICE assessment. Stupor and coma may be seen. Um, an important factor here is the depressed level of consciousness should be attributable to no other cause. So we're not giving these, we're not going to be able to say if they're getting sedating medication necessarily, um, because perhaps if they're at grade four, they might be in the ICU having airway protection, so it could be difficult to assess as well. So ICANN's management, grade one, you're talking supportive care. Way back when we talked about using anti-seizure medication, so that's super important. But then we're also going to do our basic nursing and advanced practice provider care. So we're going to reorient our patient. We're going to do serial neuro checks. We talked about every four hours doing the ICE score. Put the head of the bed up 30 degrees so our patient doesn't aspirate. Fall precautions. Um, again, we talked about Keppra. Um, you could also consider further diagnostic workups. So maybe an EEG, maybe an LP. We talked about how usually that will increase, show increased protein. Um, administer to see only if concurrent with CRS at this time. Consider dexamethasone maybe once and see if that helps with any of these symptoms. Grade two, we'll continue our supportive care. Go ahead and consult neurology. Likely we're gonna for sure order that brain MRI or EEG, possibly an LP, um, treat seizures. And then if concurrent CRS, we're gonna give the tocilizumab too. If there's no concurrent CRS within 24 hours after starting tocilizumab, we can consider dexamethasone at that point. If they're not improving, they're gonna escalate over here to grade three. So always supportive care. Likely these patients are gonna be in our ICU. We're going to follow CRS guidelines for tocilizumab, start dexamethasone 10 milligrams every six hours. And then if they're not improving, we'll go to grade four. So again, these patients are probably having to have mechanical ventilation to protect their airway. If our patients do have cerebral edema, again, making sure that bed, head of bed is elevated. Think about mannitol, hypertonic saline, hyperventilation, um, and you'll start high-dose methylpred at this point. If a patient's not improving, we can consider alternate forms of immunosuppression. So back to our patient. So on day eight, the patient's fever was still present. His blood pressure was still low, but he was having adequate oxygen saturation, but he was short of breath, still tachycardic. You can see his laboratory numbers here in bold. And we noticed there was a change in his handwriting with his signature. So he automatically got an ICE score of nine. He was given tocilizumab again due to that recurrent fever and dexamethasone 10 milligrams once. That fever curve downtrended and the ice score was back to 10. So we were all happy. But however, on day 11, we found him wandering a different part of the hospital, disoriented, unable to write a sentence, and he couldn't count backwards from 100. His ice score was six. So this also proves the importance of bed alarms here. Um, but at that point, you will give him dexamethasone. He's a grade two. I score improved within four hours, which was awesome. So he rapidly improved and it was back to 10 by day 12. So this was a short period of time. And to note, the patient will have no memory typically of this as well. I think it's also impressive to say after this episode, the patient was discharged on day plus 14. So I think I'd be remiss if I just didn't quickly mention HLH um, as a potential complications of CAR-T. So HLH or hemophagocytic lymphohistocytosis encompasses a group of severe immuno immunological disorders characterized by hyperactivation of macrophages and lymphocytes. Um, they have similar clinical manifestations irrespective of underlying cause. And patients with CRS after CAR-T therapy have clinical features and laboratory findings that resemble those of HLH. So high fever, multi-organ dysfunction, CNS disturbances, our ferritin's up, our LDH is up. Um, so CRS and HLH can be considered overlapping syndromes. That being said, patients with CRS typically respond to supportive care in anti-IL-6 therapies and corticosteroids, where HLH often necessitates additional therapy. It is rare, occurring in less than 1% of patients, and it is associated with a high mortality if not treated promptly. So this diagnosis is typically made if a patient has rising serum ferritin. If you remember our case study, it was around 1,000, so we're talking over 10,000 during the period of CRS risk. And we also monitor liver function, kidney function, monitor for pulmonary edema. Also, you'll see um, hemophagocytosis by morphology and bone marrow and other organs, and you'll see elevated circulating CD35 receptor levels. So what do we do for it? Our goal is to suppress overactive CD8 positive T cells and macrophages, 
we're going to do supportive care for our patients, and we're going to manage as grade three or greater per CRS guidelines. So you think Tosla's going to have steroids, but you're also going to notice if there's no improvement in 48 hours, let's consider systemic chemotherapy, usually a toposide. It can be repeated um, after four to seven days as indicated clinically to achieve adequate disease control. Okay. So moving on from CRS and ICANs, I wanted to talk about infection risk for these patients in ergoing CAR-T. They often have a high net state of immunosuppression, which makes them at a high rate for infection. So these are highly um, immunosuppressed patients coming into CAR, like our case study, had five prior lines of therapy. Um, and then they receive lymphodepletion prior to infusion, which further inhibits cellular immunity and causes neutropenia. We use immunosuppression to treat CRS and neurotoxicity um, that can lead to depletion of malignant and normal healthy B cell subsets. And patients will also often have persistent cytopenias for the full 30 days. So what type of infections could occur after CAR? Um, this slide is actually from our colleagues at Fred Hutch, and it's similar to transplants for those of us who also work in transplant. Um, the infections typically within the first month at the highest rate in the first two weeks, most of those are bacterial. Um, in almost all instances of bacteremia occurred within the first two weeks of CAR T cell infusion. We think about central line care, all of those things that we do as nurses. We also saw a lot of respiratory viral infections. Um, we did see an incidence, a drop off of incidence and in infection after day 30 but it's still important to monitor and we'll talk about that in our long-term complications. So how do we do to prevent these infections? What prophylaxis should we use? Again, like any of us who've dealt in transplant, we're gonna use a broad spectrum antibiotic. We're gonna use an antiviral that will cover HSV and BCV and antifungal that covers candidial infections. You're also gonna consider when should I actually put my patient on like a mold active azole. So think about someone who's already been on that for a prior infection, maybe aspergillus, they've had severe neutropenia for greater than three weeks, or they've had a lot of immunosuppression. And then we'll talk about how we recommend PVP prophylaxis in the long-term setting. So I know that was a lot for acute complications, but now your patient has made it to day 30, they're out of that window for CRS and ICANS, what should you expect as their nurse or advanced practice provider? So at Vanderbilt, we call it CAR-T graduation. We have our first imaging touch point at day 30. You're gonna initiate that anti-seizure taper on our last visit, unless it's clinically contraindicated, perhaps your patient did have seizure activity and so neurology would like you to keep that on. You're gonna consider long-term infectious prophylaxis. You're gonna monitor IgG levels and you're gonna determine a follow-up plan for your patient. So just to wrap up our case study, this is the PET scan for that patient. And as you can see on the right-hand side, he had an excellent response to CAR. Um, his day 30 PET scan showed interval response to therapy, um, decrease in size and avidity of adenopathy below and above the diaphragm. So we were all very excited about this. And to bring it home, his most recent PET scan confirms this patient is NCR, which is amazing. So one of the things we see often in our long-term CAR-T clinic is prolonged cytopenias. And why does that happen? It's multifactorial. Again, our case study had five lines of therapy. Some patients may receive bridging therapy between that collection period and when the cells are available, which can be two to three weeks. And then we're giving them chemotherapy prior to that cell infusion. Also, CRS and ICANS, while limited data, we think maybe grade three or higher may contribute. Um, you also always want to consider when someone's had lots of treatment, could this be relapse or secondary malignancy? And this can last years beyond infusions. I can tell you anecdotally, we've had patients that are receiving supportive care for years post-CAR. So how do we manage it? Again, supportive care. So growth factor, transfusion support. If patients have stem cells stored, perhaps we can do stem cell rescue. And then we're going to evaluate that bone marrow to make sure that there's no secondary malignancy. Another important thing that we follow as a long-term complication is hypogammaglobulinemia. Um, so you want to think B cell plagia is happening. Those healthy cells look similar to those lymphoma cells or the disease cells, and the CAR T cells will also take them out. So it's an on target but off tumor effect of our CARs. Um, often occurs as expansion and can last for months. So you're going to monitor those IgG levels in your clinic once the patient has come back from wherever they were receiving their infusion. 
You're going to get typically infusions monthly until we see the IgG level above 400. But if our patients are having lots of infections, perhaps we're going to need to get more IVIG. So that's important clinical decision making that you make with your team as well. So long-term infection prevention, um, we talked about our prophylactic antimicrobials through day 30. Day 90, we want to start some vaccines again for our patients. Um, typically, the COVID-19 vaccine and flu vaccine at that time. We also are checking titers for our patients in our clinic, at least for our long-term patients. And then we'll re-immunize as needed. You're also going to do PJP prophylaxis. Typically, this is Bactrim through six months. And then your antiviral prophylaxis for a year. Usually, that's until our patients can get that shingles vaccine. You're also going to want to monitor closely for any other potential viral infections. So think CMV. Um, again, anecdotally, we have seen some reactivations here at our center, so you follow that closely. Um, among one-year survival uh, survivors, there's an average of two infections per year. Most of them are URIs. I can tell you that's mostly what our clinic sees um, patients messaging in. They can't get rid of their cold. They can't get over COVID, things like that. So patient burdens post-car, and this will kind of wrap us up. So we know that our patients are going to have chronic fatigue. Over 50% of our patients report continued tiredness. I think at first when you think about that, that sounds pretty standard for our patients getting treatment. But the fact of the matter is, this is one infusion, and they haven't had any treatment for months and months, and they're still experiencing this chronic fatigue. So it can be super frustrating for our patients who are wanting to get back to work. Um, we've had patients have to do modified work duties. They've had needed physical therapy just because they can't function without taking a nap, or maybe they can make it Monday through Wednesday, and then by Thursday, they're just exhausted. So that is a phenomenon we see quite often post-CAR T, and that you can help your manage your patients and guide them. And then anxiety and depression. So there's always the concern for next imaging. So after that initial day 30, typically we're going to repeat imaging around three months. Um, if there's a concern, then you may move towards further imaging, biopsy. If there's not a concern, typically it might not be until an annual PET scan, which is super intimidating for patients who are used to being scanned constantly. And they're accustomed to continue treatment. And so it's hard for them to assume there's a living therapy in their body when they're used to cycle one, two, three. There's also uh, sociodemographic influences, so we talk about finances and family support. We ask our patients here at Vanderbilt to come to Vanderbilt while it's an outpatient facility uh, for CAR, they're still moving away. Most of our patients aren't from here. So that's really tough by the time they come back and then for us to say you need to come every month. So we really try to work with our local teams to coordinate care. So always use your resources. So behavioral health or support groups that are available. Um, that's really been helpful for our patients in the long-term setting. And then here are my references. And thank you so much for your attention. And I will take any questions. Thank you, Nancy. That was just fantastic. Uh, very, very comprehensive overview of the CAR-T therapy and where we are right now. And uh, you really summarize it nicely about the early and the late toxicity we see with this treatment. So. Uh, while we wait for uh, some of the questions from the participants of this webinar, I have a few notes. Uh, I was wondering if you can kind of uh, shed some light for our uh, audience here. Uh, so one issue with uh, current CAR T cell therapy is, of course, uh, is the manufacturing time, right? And depending on what type of CAR T therapy you decided to use for your patients, it can take anywhere from uh, two and a half to four to sometimes even six weeks for myeloma CAR T. And can you kind of give us uh, some uh, of your center's practice about patients with high-grade lymphoma, with rapidly progressive disease, uh, after you have collected their uh, lymphocytes and they're being manufactured, what are the options for them to kind of stay out of trouble, so to say, uh, before their CAR T's are back on, on site for administration? Yeah, I think that's a really good uh, question. And often we do use bridging therapy for those high-risk patients. Um, we try to coordinate so they can receive it locally. Um, 
I know in the past, sometimes we've used a pulse dosing of steroids too, to get the patients through. Um, other times we're using directed therapy. Oftentimes I've seen polituzumab, rituxan used for our patients. That's why it's super important to get that baseline imaging as well, even post um, leukapheresis or T-cell collection. And then to follow our patients closely, we have them do dressing changes. So they're seeing their local once a week too, to see if any symptoms arise that's concerning for disease progression. And I think we have some uh, excellent questions coming uh, in the chat box here. Uh, would you recommend doing an opening pressure uh, when you do a lumbar puncture for patients with uh, severe neurotoxicity? Yes, we would. Um, and so working with our colleagues in the inpatient setting to ensure that's done is important as well. Yeah, I would say that it we request it a lot more often, but it's kind of hard to get an accurate measurements in inpatient setting because you have to set up the patient mm -hmm. and, and it's just uh, technically sometimes not always feasible because many of our LPs are done by uh, radiology and fluoroscopy suite. Uh, but it is definitely helpful in my opinion. Uh, um, if you're not able to get it uh, in opening pressure, I recommend that at least call your colleague in ophthalmology to do a fundoscopic exam to look for pepeloidema because uh, that could be an indirect sign of increased intracranial pressure, uh, signs of uh, cerebral edema. And one thing I want to mention, I, would, I think I would be remiss if I didn't, is the resources to find these grading scales for us. There's an excellent app through ASTCT that you can download and quickly grade your patient at the bedside too. So I want the, the group to know about that. Let me try to find the link and put it in the chat box here. We have another question here. Uh, would you recommend that it is necessary uh, to have a nurse's experience in a stem cell transplant uh, before they take care of the patient's uh, with a CAR T-cell therapy, what's your opinion? I think that's a really fair question, but I think like we talked about, you're seeing CRS and ICANs and other treatment modalities as well. So I think this is an op opportunity to empower your nurses to be educated on these specific toxicities. It obviously helps in most centers, I think, are, are using similar processing labs, so they're grouped together typically, um, but I think all nurses can learn about these toxicities and treat their patients appropriately. Um, one additional question I had was, uh, Nancy, uh, what is your vaccination schedule once this individual, um, because many of them, I assume, had prior autologous transplant or allogenic transplant, uh, and then they receive a CAR T-cell therapy, and after the resolution of initial acute toxicity, do you vaccinate all of them, or do you check their titers for pneumococcal or hepatitis, what's your practice? Yes, so hopefully after their autologous transplant, if they had time, they were revaccinated. Um, so we do recheck titers. Uh, we actually have an ongoing uh, clinical trial here doing that as well. So we'll recheck them in the long-term clinic. Some of them won't need any of the vaccines like measles, mumps, rubella, others will. So we just try to advocate for our patients and give them that information up front. Uh, Brittany Bear has asked questions, the benefit of having a long-term CAR-T clinic. Uh, what's your opinion on that? I, mean, I know many of the centers may not have resources for this kind of setup. Uh, mm -hmm. um, so what do you think is an ideal uh, structure to take care of these patients? That's a great question. So we are super lucky here at Vanderbilt to have a long-term clinic. We have excellent nursing staff and physician support and APP support for it. It is tough for our patients sometimes to return to our center if they're far away, but I think it allows guidance for these local centers that aren't seeing CAR-T being infused near them so that we can treat some of these long-term complications, infections, IVI, or if they need IVIG guidance on that as well. But I know it's not available at every center, but I think it's really worthwhile for our patients. Yeah, I do suggest that at least develop a center-specific comprehensive long-term plan. Uh, even though uh, you may not be seeing these patients on a regular basis uh, uh, more often, but uh, make sure that you have a document or a, some type of flow sheet to share with local provider uh, regarding the monitoring of cytopenia, hypogammaglobulinemia, uh, infection prophylaxis, and so on, so that they can, they can manage these toxicities if they arise. Uh, and you can see the patients every six months to a year for imaging for disease surveillance. Uh, and that's certainly feasible. Having a dedicated support staff and a dedicated clinic is, is ideal, but uh, um, certainly not necessarily. 
There's another question uh, here is, uh, do you see difference in consequences of CAR T cell therapy? So uh, I think the question is regarding the side effects of CAR T cell therapy in a patient with multiple myeloma or lymphoma. Nancy, why don't you give your experience and then I'll put uh, some of my comments later. So the different side effects we've seen for, for those different diagnoses are, are typically our patients having um, CAR T for myeloma. Honestly, I've seen delayed side effects, but also not to the extent that we've seen for some of our lymphoma um, products that we've given here at Vanderbilt. Yeah, I would I would have to agree with that. Again, we we one thing to keep in mind is that when you are comparing the toxicity, uh, also there is a different level of side effects between the different CAR T product. Um, so just to can kind of give you an example, even in lymphoma. We have three different CD19 directed CAR T cell therapy: um, the T cell, lysocell, and uh, X cell. Uh, and uh, overall, uh, the published literature and and then post approval data shows that um, there is a higher degree of severe side effects uh, with uh, X cell compared to T cell and lysocell. Uh, but with appropriate prophylaxis, those things can be managed well. Uh, similarly, in multiple myeloma, we have two FDA-approved CAR T-cell therapy, both targeting the BCMA, B-cell maturation antigen on the plasma cell, the IDA cell and SILTA cell. And, and they have, of course, subtle differences in terms of the side effects between these two products. Uh, uh, however, in our experience, we have seen less severe CRS neurotoxicity uh, in patients receiving uh, therapy for multiple myeloma compared to high-grade B-cell lymphoma. Uh, it also may have to do with uh, uh, our centers using um, bridging therapy universally in almost every case. Uh, so the overall burden of the disease is a little bit less. Uh, we also uh, use a lot of research CAR T cell therapy. So these are off the shelf CAR T cell products uh, and they have different, different side effect profile. Um, so, yeah. There's one more question about your outpatient program. Uh, what percentage are admitted within first 10 days and what uh, any specific devices you guys are using for remote monitoring? Um, so we do have a clinical trial ongoing, so that's using a separate remote monitoring platform. Um, currently, we're using something called Current Health, which is a wearable device. We tell our patients it's like an Apple Watch that you put on your upper arm to monitor these patients. I would say we have seen, uh, the biggest change I think is with the prophylactic steroids. Um, Dr. Deloy, I don't know if you would agree with that as well, decreasing the time for seeing the symptoms of CRS and subsequent admission. I will say we, we treat early here at Vanderbilt. If you're having some of these side effects, we tell our patients we don't want them to suffer with fevers, things like that. So most of our patients would be admitted at some point, but we do have our patients that are outpatient throughout the whole procedure. Yeah, I would say um, around a third of the patients can finish the whole process without ever going into the uh, hospital. And that's what we found in our single center experience that, that, that is similar to what has been published also with Isocell. Um, so there is a, a subset of patients who never had to go to the hospital. Um, and the key here is to selecting the right patients for outpatient therapy. Of course, if somebody has extremely high burden disease on oxygen, on lots of pain medicine, um, recent infection or DVT, uh, those are the patients you really should not subject to outpatient therapy because they, they will require much closer monitoring from the get-go. Uh, but uh, somebody who is otherwise in a good performance status and, and organ functions are maintained well, uh, you responding to bridging therapy, um, low body disease, those, those patients can be easily um, administered CAR T, chemotherapy, everything out patients and monitored remotely. A uh, few uh, of my personal experience with using this remote monitoring devices, we have several instances where uh, we find out about the fever before patients realize that they were having fever. So it's definitely is a useful tool uh, in terms of uh, picking up the early grade CRS. Uh, however, uh, there, there are a lot of nuances. First of all, you need to have a dedicated person who can monitor uh, these devices and the data, which is coming 24 seven. Uh, at our centers, we use uh, our, our nocturnal nurse practitioners to, use, do, uh, to do the monitoring. Um, however, uh, depending on the center's resources, it may be a physician, fellows, or a nurse. 
Uh, other thing is these devices and the, the, the platforms of uh, remote monitoring are not always user-friendly to work with. Uh, they don't talk with the EMR we have, um, so that there is a data of fever and blood pressure and everything, but it's in a separate platform than our patient charts, uh, and that can sometimes lead to some of the loss of data. Um, so it is still work in progress, I would say, and there is no perfect remote monitoring platform as of now. Um, similar to EMR. So uh, I think you should use whichever is uh, cheaper uh, and whatever is easily it can be incorporated in your practice. I think there is uh, there are several other patients. Uh, which chemo protocol you use prior to CAR T cell therapy? Uh, and see. Yeah, so for the we're using efludirubin and cytoxin regimen. Okay. Yeah, uh, at our centers, we have stick to the standard flu side across the board. Uh, of course, we uh, we are fortunate to have enough flu data being supplies uh, compared to other centers in the country in the United States where uh, we experienced the severe flu data being shortages and they had to resort to alternative lymphoid depletion regimen such as bendamustine. Um, and I think that's, that's still a reasonable thing to try. Uh, if somebody has prior severe toxicity of fluorabine or you can't get a hold of fluorabine, I think bendamustine is a, is a reasonable alternative in those situations. Uh, and there's another uh, question is mortality of these patients, so more from relapses or more from complication? Of course, it's a relapse, relapse and relapse. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't actually lost our patients to toxicity uh, from the CAR T cell therapy and we've been doing CAR T for over seven years now. Um, it is, it is uh, relapse remains the main problem uh, despite um, having early efficacy uh, with the CAR T cell therapy and the most relapses are seen within first uh, three to six months. Uh, and that's where these people will start showing signs of early resistance. And uh, whenever you see the progression on the imaging, uh, do uh, uh, always try to get a, a repeat biopsy uh, because there are different mechanisms of resistance and relapse. Uh, if you have uh, a lymphoma, which is previously CD19 positive, that is a small subset which will lose the target uh, after they have relapsed. So they may have relapsed without that antigen, which was recognized by CAR T cell therapy. So you can have an active CAR Ts in your blood, but they are not being rec uh, recognized by the tumor cell. So uh, that, of course, is a less of a problem for high-grade B cell lymphoma, where the majority of the relapses still has some uh, CD19 expression. But in a B cell ALL, uh, that is that is much more frequent. So always uh, try to obtain another tissue sample if you can, because that will help you determine your next line of treatment. Uh, if you're trying to use similarly targeting drugs such as long cow or tafacitamab, both of which also target the CD19 antigen, um, and certainly that's not going to be an option if your tumor does not have that. Um, so yeah, but relapse remains the main problem, uh, despite. This being a very expensive resource-intensive therapy, we cure roughly half of our patients with lymphoma with this thing. Okay. Um, I think that's, uh, I don't see any more questions. Uh, that was wonderful uh, presentations and Q&A sessions. And I hope uh, our audience uh, got some good uh, um, real world experience and tricks from you, Nancy. So thank you so much for sharing your experience. And uh, this uh, recording will be uploaded and uh, it will be available through ICH website for everybody to review in the future free of cost. And our contact information is in the last slide. So feel free to email Nancy directly. She she She's the boss when it comes to outpatient CAR T cell therapy at our center. So um, uh, thank you everyone for joining today. Thank you very much.